We just finished the election of 1968, and we're going to move on to Nixon's plan for Vietnam. Nixon was elected president this election. Are we ready? Okay, um, obviously the major headache that President Nixon inherited from the Johnson administration was the Vietnam War. And this was something he was going to have to deal with. And not only did he have to inherit the war at a full scale, he also had to inherit problems inside the United States as well concerning the Vietnam War. So again, Nixon inherited a major headache from the Johnson administration, which was the Vietnam War. And even considering Vietnam was at full scale when he took over, he also had problems inside the country as, as well. Anybody know what those were? Or the biggest problem he had to have to do with the Vietnam War inside the country? Violence and protests. He, the biggest interior problem he had to deal with with these continued protests against the war is because protesters were basically tearing the country apart at that point. They were out protesting in every way, which way they could. It was causing some issues and some support for the war. Pretty hard to be a Vietnam soldier, a soldier fighting in Vietnam, and everybody's protesting against the war that you're fighting. It makes you kind of wonder, what am I doing here if everybody's spending so much time uh, protesting? Now, what was Nixon's promise concerning Vietnam when he ran in the presidential campaign in 68, Stacia? What did he promise? He would like give an honorable end. Right, he would bring an honorable end to the Vietnam War. And more, why did he not give specific reasons or things he was going to do during the campaign what he was going to do in Vietnam? Why did he do that? Right. They were negotiating and he did not want to mess up any peace negotiations. So it was in the summer of 1969 when he made his plans for Vietnam public. Okay? So it was in the summer of 69. Remember, he took office in January of 69, and then he disclosed his plans for Vietnam the summer of 1969. And it consisted basically of two philosophies. Okay? This was Nixon's plan for Vietnam, two philosophies concerning the war. Anybody want to guess what he might have, what, what it might have been, or any, either one of them? What was, what was something he was going to do? Going to Cambodia? Not yet. Yeah, that was a bad move, actually. That isn't what he said. Wow. What's that? Laos. Wow. Yeah, that's where he's going to head. But what, before that, when he told the people what he was going to do, what, what, what might he do with the Vietnam War? Anybody have a clue? Number one, he told the American people he planned to withdraw, gradually withdraw, American troops from Vietnam. Okay, He was going to start the gradual withdrawal of American troops from Vietnam. In other words, he was going to take out so many at a time over a long period of time. That would be gradual. So he called for a gradual withdrawal of American troops in Vietnam. The second thing was kind of interesting because he stated that Americans would only fight the enemy on the defensive. They would only fight the enemy on the defensive. What does that mean? They would only, they were only, they would only fight when attacked, when they had to defend themselves. They would no longer go on the offensive. So what he's basically doing is he's telling the American people that he's going to gradually withdraw from Vietnam, and then he's going to fight only on the defensive. So he's going to slowly withdraw us out of that war, bring the war to an end in an honorable fashion, right? Kind of withdraw us out slowly, not just leave the South Vietnamese cold turkey and get out of there, and we're only going to fight on the defensive if we have to defend ourselves. We will no longer try to take any land, we'll just defend what we want, okay? Now, what would be the result of that that maybe would stop the protesting in America when he announces this? What is going to be less, what's going to be happening less if we withdraw gradually and fight only on the defensive? The draft. No, good guess. What do you say? The draft. That's a good guess. No, that, not, that's a good guess, but it's not, what, is that going to, so we're not going to draft, is that what you're saying, that would keep the protesters down? Yeah. Okay, that's a good guess, but not exactly right. What's more importantly than that? Absolutely. Less soldiers would be killed. The body counts would go down, and he thought that would quiet the protesting. So he believed that if he gradually withdrew troops from Vietnam and only fought on the defensive, that it would reduce the loss of American lives, which would quiet the protesting that was going all the way around the country. Actually, it was a good move. It was probably a good strategy, okay, popular strategy at the time. However, our next subtopic is where he made the big mistake, and that's Nixon's decision to advance into Cambodia. 
a Nixon's decision to advance in Cambodia. Anybody know where Cambodia is in reference to Vietnam? Right on the border. Right on the border, and it would be east of Vietnam. Okay? Now, in April of 1970, Richard Nixon made a huge mistake, although everybody, not everybody at the time, but I, you, you'll, you'll probably be able to understand why he did this. But in April of 1970, he sent 31,000 American troops into Cambodia. April of 1970, he sent 31,000 American troops into Cambodia. Cambodia is a country that wasn't involved in this war. Yet we sent 31,000 troops into <laughs> Cambodia. Why did he do that? Why did he invade Cambodia? What was in Cambodia that he wanted to get rid of? What had the North Vietnamese put in Cambodia? What? Military supplies. They had made military supply centers throughout Cambodia. And Nixon felt he needed to go into Cambodia and get rid of those North Vietnamese military supply centers because obviously that was aiding in North Vietnam's effort in killing American soldiers, right? So he sends 31,000 American troops into Cambodia, a country that's not involved, so to speak, in the Vietnam War, because he wants to clear out some military supply centers that the North Vietnamese have stationed across the border in Cambodia so they'd be protected from American forces, because they didn't think America would do what? Advance into Cambodia. Well, this invasion of Cambodia really caused a storm of protest in the United States especially on college campuses, especially on college campuses. So protests about Nixon's move into Cambodia started occurring in all types of college atmospheres. On college campuses, protests were springing up like you couldn't believe. Well, one particular protest of note happened at Kent State University became very publicized and resulted in a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph, similar in, in philosophy to that of Lee Harvey Oswald being shot by Jack Ruby while handcuffed to Jim Lavelle. Okay, Kent State University. And it occurred on May 4th of 1970. So the most notable campus protest occurred at Kent State University. Anybody know what state that's in? Ohio. And this is what happened. It's entitled a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph called, called a God Awful Screed. So we'll, we'll read through this. John Philo. While I was a student at Kent State, I worked as a lab technician at the School of Journalism. That Monday morning, I opened up the lab about 8 a.m. This was after a nasty weekend, not just at Kent State, but all over the country. Most colleges and universities were erupting after Nixon's announcement of the Cambodian invasion. The National Guard had been called up on Saturday after the ROTC building was burned. At noon, we closed the lab to go down to the rally right outside the journalism building, Taylor Hall. When I got there, the guard and the students had confronted each other across the commons, about 200 yards apart. Suddenly, there was a series of tear gas barrages and I was running back and forth between the two groups taking pictures of the conflict. The guardsmen lined up with fixed bayonets. Can you imagine that? Fixed bayonets, that's knives on the end of their rifles. And made a sweep across the commons towards Taylor Hall. This is on a college campus. They didn't bother me, although I didn't give them a chance to get within striking distance of a nightstick. By following them, I ended up in the parking lot behind Taylor Hall. There were about 75 guardsmen, helmeted and wearing black gas masks. They looked gross. It was grotesque. After about five minutes, the guards started moving to the top of the hill. As they were moving back, the students followed them, keeping a distance of about 150 feet. The hostile body of the crowd was shouting and throwing rocks at the guard. I was jogging to get in position behind this group and the guardsmen in the background so, we, so I could show the relationship of the two and also to be close should anything happen. The guard was moving backward, dodging rocks. As they reached the crest of the hill, they turned suddenly, dropped to one knee, and began firing directly into the crowd. People started running in all directions. When the firing started, the people came roaring back down the sidewalk. It was a two-foot drop from there down to the street, and if you're running and don't expect it, you could break a leg. So I was yelling at these people, this is just a scare tactic. I could see no reason for these rifles to be pointing into the crowd and firing away, 
unless they were using blanks. I was screaming, don't run, you're going to break your leg. I couldn't imagine live ammunition. As I was, excuse me, I was standing up, dodging back and forth, grabbing these people as they ran by me. The firing was still going on. It seemed like an awfully long time. I raised the camera to my eye, got focused on the guardsman shooting right at me. My finger is on the button, the shutter on its way down, and in that moment I see over the right side of the viewfinder a bullet slam into a metal sculpture going right through it and blasting a hole in a tree. The whole sculpture shook and a cloud of rust settled around it. I just dropped my camera and said, my God, someone is firing real bullets. I thought someone had made a mistake. Then the firing stopped. There were people laying all over the grass. I'm the only one standing up on the sidewalk. There was an officer out in front of the guardsman with his hands up to tell them to stop shooting. As I turned around directly over my left shoulder, I saw the body of Jeff Miller. He had been shot in the neck. It could only have been a few seconds, but already the blood was extensive, like kicking over a bucket of blood. With the realization that they were firing live ammunition, I said, this is crazy, I've got to get out of here, and started walking away. I think I took three steps and said, wait a minute, someone's got to document this. I turned back around. Wounded and dying people are laying all around me. Other people are pulling themselves off the ground. No one is going near the body, and this girl, Marianne Vecchio, comes running up the street, and she kneels down beside the body. I started walking toward her. Her body was shaking. She was crying, and then she screamed, a god-awful scream. My reflexes took over, and that was it, one frame. After it was all over and the university was closed, I took upon myself to get the pictures out. The biggest thing with me was that I didn't think people would believe what had happened. It seemed so unreal. You have to understand that at this time, I was very paranoid about what was going to happen. I didn't know if someone was going to try to stop me and take my film away. I was trying to get this film into my pocket, and I was thinking about hiding it in my Volkswagen until I got to Pennsylvania. I really thought someone had blundered in killing these people, and there was going to be a mass cover-up. Already the radio reports were saying that two guardsmen and only two students were killed. Everybody was shocked at the false reports. They weren't telling what really happened. As I was driving to Pennsylvania, I began to wonder if I, if I really had the photographs or not. I said to myself, I think I remember seeing it happen, and I think I remember fo fo photographing it, but I'm not sure. Because I was so frightened, I can remember the camera to my eye, but I was trying to remember whether the shutter was going off. It was such an intense thing. I was lucky. There were people killed on both sides of me. I don't know how I escaped without being hit. It's something I will always be thankful for. The girl in the photo, Marianne Vecchio, was not a student at Kent State. She turned out to be a 14-year-old runaway from Florida just drifting through the campus on this day. Jeff Miller wasn't a radical or a leader. In fact, he was not politically active. He liked playing the drums, wore his hair long, was shy of girls, and was concerned about social problems. He felt angered and betrayed by the Cambodian invasion. The students told that Kent State stands at four dead and five badly wounded. Among the guardsmen, one man was injured on the arm by a rock. They fired live ammunition in the crowd and killed those people. That picture there is that young lady over the body of that Miller boy, uh, which ended up being a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph on the part of the photographer. Can you imagine that on a college campus, that going on? That's what happened. That's it's just amazing. Yeah, it's just amazing. The only good thing that occurred after this event at Kent State is the Senate, immediately after this happened, voted to repeal what? The Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. So immediately after the events at Kent State, the Senate voted to repeal the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Well, this happened when? May 4, 1970. In late June of 1970, when did Nixon end his military presence? Where? Where did he end the military presence? In Cambodia. So Nixon got it, but it cost us a lot of bad feelings. Okay? Yep, so after uh, the, the incident on May 4, 1970 at Kent State, the Senate voted to repeal the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, and in late June of 1970, Nixon withdrew all American troops from Cambodia. Okay? Late June. Late June, yep. Yeah. Okay, that'll take us to the ceasefire agreement in Vietnam. We finally come up with a ceasefire agreement. I think you'll be surprised at the date. You know what the date was? We reached an agreement in Vietnam. When did they start? When did we start talking about? 
Wasn't it, wasn't it Lyndon Johnson on March 31st, 1968 that started the peace negotiations? They ended on January 27, 1973. January 27, 1973. It took almost how many years? Five. So on January 27, 1973, a ceasefire agreement was finally reached in Vietnam. This is what the agreement stated. Where did they open? Yep, January 27th, 1973, the ceasefire agreement was reached in Vietnam. Here was the parts of the agreement. Number one, this agreement allowed the continued presence of North Vietnamese forces in South Vietnam. Think about that. Number one, this agreement allowed the continued presence of North Vietnamese forces in South Vietnam. It allowed the continued presence of North Vietnamese forces in South Vietnam. What is that telling you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Didn't, we didn't gain a thing, really, did we? In a lot of ways. Number two, it did assure, though, that South Vietnam would have a government of its choosing. Assured that South Vietnam would have a government of its choosing. So although, number one, we're going to allow the continued presence of North Vietnamese forces in South Vietnam, number two, it did assure that South Vietnam would have a government of its choosing. And three, the agreement guaranteed that the United States would continue to give economic and military aid to South Vietnam. Would that include troops? No. So it guaranteed that the United States would continue to give economic and and military aid to South Vietnam. So, the agreement again, number one, allowed the continued presence of North Vietnamese forces in South Vietnam. Number two, assured that South Vietnam would have a government of its own choosing. And three, guaranteed that the United States would continue to give economic and military aid to South Vietnam. Once that agreement was signed by all parties, what did Nixon do? He withdrew the remaining troops out of Vietnam, and prisoners of war were supposed to be released on both sides. So, as soon as this was agreed upon, signed by all the parties, President Nixon ordered the withdrawal of the remaining troops in Vietnam, and prisoners of war were to be released. Okay, that'll take us to our next subtopic then, is the Vietnam War, a very tragic end. Now, I want you just to listen to this, okay, and tell me what you think in your mind here. So when is the agreement signed? What year? 1973. In late April of 1975, in late April of 1975, Seoul, the capital of South Vietnam, was completely surrounded by North Vietnamese. On that date, there are still American soldiers there, and any of you know, really just right, just listen. American soldiers and any South Vietnamese civilians that worked for the U.S. government had passes to evacuate Seoul on American aircraft. Now, picture that in your mind. If you were an American soldier that was over there providing military aid, or you were a South Vietnamese civilian that worked for the United States government you were given a pass that you would allow you to get on an American aircraft to take you out of this near riot in Seoul in late April 1975. Okay, does that, can you picture that in your mind? You had to have a pass. Okay, if you didn't have a pass, you couldn't, couldn't get on. Okay, and this included soldiers and civilians that worked for the U.S. government. Well, they had a plan. It was so bad there that when the song White Christmas by Bing Crosby was broadcast on a specific radio station in Seoul, that's when you knew you better get your pass and get to the helicopter pad. Okay, that was the signal. I heard it. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Well, Bing Crosby sang that. And when that song came on on a certain radio station in Seoul, that was the signal to get your passes and get to the heliport so you could get on a helicopter. Okay? Well, when evacuation began, 
Those American helicopters withdrew the remaining American soldiers and any citizens that had worked for the U.S. government that had a pass. Now, it got crazy because what would you do to get a pass? Anything. So people were taking passes. People were actually getting on the helipads without passes. Okay? Many South Vietnamese citizens were transported depending on who they knew within the American government. They might not even have a pass. And I'm not kidding you, the, the, the uh, scene turned so ugly, civilians were running up on the helipads that didn't have passes and trying to get into aircraft as they took off. Some even grabbed the landing gear of the helicopters as they took off and dropped to their death because they couldn't get in it. I mean, they were doing anything they could to get the hell out of Seoul at that time. Many, many people fell to their deaths grabbing onto pieces of the helicopters that took off. And in the end, when you think about it, who took over the South Vietnamese government? The communists. So that's why everybody has such ill feelings about what the hell were we doing over there anyway. Now, did it work out in today's history that South Vietnamese is non-communist? Or South, Viet South Vietnam non-communist thing? Yeah, it is. Yeah, really, it's just kind of an interesting thing. But that was the problem. Now, here's an interesting thing. Gerald Ford, who was on the Warren Commission, who will eventually be President of the United States, actually has a set of steps that were made from the helipad to the helicopter so they could get up the steps and get on the helicopter. He has them in the Gerald Ford Library in Michigan. The actual steps from Seoul that those people were trying to get on. And it was just a terrible sight. Okay? So that's why the feelings were so ill. So, Write down what you want, get it off the video, but I want you just to listen to that, okay? Now we move back to the note-taking process. The next subtopic is a big price for the country of South Vietnam.